Thank you. My opening line was going to be, I guarantee that the rest of the presentation isn't going to be as entertaining as what Adam just did. But hopefully it's more informative. Um, so the original title of this was Advanced Architectural Patterns. Um, and and uh, as the conference has been going on, I've been watching speaker after speaker come up and talk about these great patterns. And I've been very psyched on the one hand. On the other hand, I'm like, what am I going to talk about in my presentation? Because, because I'm going to be talking about the, a lot of the same things. And, um, but um, my approach is going to be a little bit different because I'm actually going to be showing a lot of code. And so um, actually, just recently, I went through the exercise of trying to take uh, a classic backbone application and refactor it to use some of these patterns that, that I've, I've come to learn and love. So, so um, with that, slide number one, I'm going to get right into code already. And yes, I'm using to do MVC. Yes, um, that is. Uh, I think it's a good app to show. I know we've all seen it before, but we all know the code intimately. And so I don't have to spend a lot of time telling you what the code does and what everything is, I hope, anyway. So if you're not familiar with to do MVC, uh, it's fairly simple. Uh, I need to do a task. You can add tasks. You can mark them as complete. Uh, I think I can bring the font size down a bit. Uh, I can clear the completed ones. I can filter just to see the active or completed ones. Let me complete ones so you can see. So I think everybody gets the idea. OK, so let's take a look at the code. Uh, HTML5, let me see that. Uh, we've got some interesting things here. I'm just going to point out some interesting things. And the reason I'm pointing them out is because I'm going to be refactoring this code over and over again. Actually, the seven versions of this. Um, I thought um, my, my, my teammate, uh, Brian Cavalier, um, often he does his presentations this way. He'll generate you know, seven versions of code and, and demonstrate each one. I thought I could beat them with eight versions, but I, I'm at least matching them. But anyways, I'm going to point out some things here. Uh, we've got a, a style sheet uh, in the head, and we've got some interesting things here. We've got some IDs that point at interesting things in the body. We've got these embedded templates uh, in the, the popular fake script style. And we have a bunch of scripts at the bottom. Yeah, pretty pretty classic. Here we've got a JS folder, and we've got some some modules here. This is using the module pattern. First thing we see is the classic example of using the module pattern. Um, ensuring that we have global, we ensure that our global exists, and we proceed to use it as a namespace. Quotes for you guys in the back and start decorating it, you know, the, the classic pattern here. You can see um, some other examples, a uh, very interesting example here. You know, we use this app variable in the things we've decorated all throughout our code. So, What's wrong with this situation? I don't know what's wrong with this guy, but, but what's wrong with this code? Um, first thing is there's lots of many, you know, lots of uh, script and, and link tags. There's actually only one link tag in this. I've seen, I just was looking at an app the other day and it had seven, seven links and then 26 script tags in it. And, uh, you know, um, these are blocking. So, so basically, well, Chrome does a good job of trying to make them as synchronous as possible, but you can actually watch the, um, the water, waterfall in the, in the network tab, and you can see that there's actually some blocking going on. And um, so even in the fastest of browsers, all these script and, and script elements and links are, are, are slowing things down. And, and how, do you, how do you do dependency management? You know, in a reasonable size app, you know, how, how, do, you, how do you manage this stuff here? How, how, how can you reasonably call this, you know, basically your, your manually ordering these, these script elements here. So. And the other problem is, of course, globals. I mean, we've, we've heard time and time again, globals are bad. Um, you know, identifier conflicts is just the beginning of it. The real problem was what I showed before, and that is that 
So you, I have to read this entire file here in order to see where the dependencies are because because browser globals are way too easy to use even when you've namespaced them you know so now there's a dependency here on this to do's thing and i have to read the code to know it so so uh, module systems will help us out here and actually es6 does a really good job of doing that so and and because it's like i'm saying it because it's so easy it's an exercise in self-control there's nothing we can do really there's I don't even know if the linting tools will help us out enough in order to, to stop creating this massive dependency graph. Um, uh, I think it was, um, I know, it was uh, one of the guys yesterday um, showed a dependency graph. And, that, and that's a typical pe dependency graph, I think, that you get just from using globals <coughs> and not thinking about, you know, very carefully thinking about your architecture. So, so yes, a uh, great solution is to use JavaScript modules. Um, Let's take a look. I did a refactor on that. And, uh, I cannot see anything that's going on here. Try this. Yes. All right. Okay. okay. So the first thing I did is, uh, let's take a look at index.html. You can see that the, the um, style sheet's gone. Uh, that's, uh, I'll show you where that goes in a minute. And, and again, these are my patterns. These are my favorite patterns. And there are many ways to do this right. So um, I'm not going to get up here and, and start stomping and say this is, this is always the right thing. But you can also notice that, that there's, there's no more script elements in the bottom. And there's just one in the head. We can put this at the top. We put it at the bottom. It really depends on your overall strategy. If you're going to try to get some content up to the user first, or if the content's really described in your application, is your application going to build the content? Then you can put the script tags about anywhere. And actually, this app is so damn small, the HTML is, that it really doesn't matter too much where the script element goes. And so you can see that this script is actually going to pull in. Um, it's going to pull in. Uh, it's going to put a pull in curl.js, which is a module loader. And let's take a look quick here. Um, before, the way this was structured was a JS folder, and all the JavaScript was just shoved in this, this one folder. And, and uh, you know, Tim was making me feel really nice when he, he showed um, basically this component-driven um, structure for the application. This is my favorite way to do it. So, so I created, um, I didn't want to break this up into too many small components because it just would have been a myriad of, of files. But so. But I wanted to break it up into at least some components, so I created this to-dos folder where I put all the to-do-ish stuff. Uh, you can see we've got um, we've got a view here for to-dos. Um, I'm using common JS modules here. Uh, you can see the, the typical common JS. We're going to require a few essential things. We're going to require a few application-level things, um, and then eventually we're going to export something. This is going to get configured. Um, I agree with Tim. Config step and um, application launch should be separate processes, so I just split them up here. And this is just typical you know, require JS slash AMD config. So. All right. So what, what what's what's the advantages here for modules? Um, the, the module loaders are obviously non-blocking. This is going to go fast. Uh, you can better organize your code. Uh, the dependency management is all built in because of these requires. You're being explicit about, about your dependencies. Uh, namespacing is actually configurable. I can change this, this namespace, um, and all the dependency management will still work. Um, and, and most importantly, the, the the dependencies are explicit. There's nothing stopping me from taking this require, though, and embedding it somewhere down in the code. Um, so there is a certain level of, of, um, of discipline that needs to happen with common JS. With ES6, that's actually fixed, because you can no longer embed um, the import statements or the export statements down somewhere in code. They have to be at the top level, so they're, they're always, they're, they're much more visible. So, so that problem of, of, of visualizing the map um, 
by you know by looking at the source code gets a lot easier. So. Okay. So yes, thank you, Tim, for going over all this stuff for me. So so let's take a look at um, this. I just did look at that. So, but what's the problem with this? There's still a lot of dependencies. If I go back in here, look at this module right here has six dependencies just to get started. So I, I don't like that. I, I am actually anti-dependency. I will get rid of every single dependency I can. And, and that seems like a really strange thing to say because you need things to come together in order to make your application work. But I'm going to show you a few strategies here. So. Um, one of the reasons I do not like dependencies is because when I go to write my tests, now I've got to figure out how to mock or stub um, those, those dependencies so that I can isolate the, the thing that I'm testing. So. And um, when you're pulling them in with require, that means you have to mock require somehow or, or circumvent it because now you know, it's the system that's actually bringing you in your dependencies. So one solution to deal with this is inversion of control. And in a very quick summary, inversion of control is strategies and patterns where instead of trying to grab resources from within your code, the, code, the resources and dependencies are injected in. They come from outside. And so um, this, this actually gives you a lot of flexibility. And we're going to go over three of these um, very, very quickly. We're going to go over dependency injection, um, AOP and this composition plants. So uh, dependency injection is is uh, oh we saw it yesterday so so that's great I don't need to really uh, go over it in too much detail but but as we we saw um, uh, presentation yesterday you can inject um, dependencies into the constructor. There are other ways to inject dependencies too. You can inject them as properties, but um, the way the backbone um, model uh, models and views work, they really need to go into the constructor because you're, you're going to be working with them um, pretty much during the, con the construction phase of the, the model of the view. So. Um, and this prevents you from having to mock the environment because programmatically we're going to be inserting things rather than allowing the system to give us the things we want. So. And this also makes it easy for the implementation of that thing that's injected, the dependency can change from moment to moment. So you can start up your app in a different environment and inject other things, whereas with require, you have to go through this mapping configuration to get things to, to, to switch around. And, 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 and uh, you can actually make runtime decisions <laughs> and decide what to inject if you're injecting rather than requiring. So, so let's take a look at uh, an early version of that. So with this version, all I did was change some things around. Um, you can see there used to be six dependencies here. Now there are only three. And instead, I'm doing something very similar to what we saw the other day, and that is using the options of the initialize method to inject some of the um, dependencies. So specifically here, I'm injecting to do filter and to do template. So I'm injecting um, this to-do filter here, which is an embarrassingly small module. Um, what, let me back up a second. The, 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 when I first just converted over from globals to modules, that's all I did. It took every single global, everything that's hanging off the global, and turned it into a module. So that's why I ended up with this one here. Don't worry, we're going to get rid of this module later. I'll show you. The other thing I'm um, um, doing here that uh, Tim showed as well is using um, text templates as modules as well. So these get pulled in as requirements um, as well. Um, just thinking I should have showed what that looked like before um, before we went with the uh, dependency inversion just to show you one step at a time. But Okay, so let's take a look at what this looks like now. So view, like I said, um, now only has what I'm calling infrastructure or essential requires now. So what, what's nice about these 
is, you know, obviously we're going to be coding against these. So it's great to have them, you know, they're available to us while we're defining and you know, while we're authoring this here. To inject these would be just kind of weird. Um, the other thing is that during testing, you kind of need to trust something somewhere. And so in tests, you know, can you, can you trust these things? And I think the general answer is yes. You need to trust your third party app, um, your third party libraries. And so um, I'm not worried about the re re require here and not having to stub these because I'm going to just trust they work. So again, here's another view. All it requires here are the three essentials. And injected are the other things that, that it uses. If you remember, uh, this to-dos was app.todos before, and it was just strewn throughout the app. Now I'm making it a property and referring to it as a local property. So let's take a look at main.js, which um, I'm going to show you what the difference is here. Let me compare with the previous branch. Okay, so main.js was pretty simple before. Main.js, basically just to get the application running. Uh, there's this little workaround here that I was having some issues with uh, with Backbone not automatically adding the, the um, jQuery. I don't know if it's supposed to do that automatically in CommonJS or not, but it didn't seem to like that. So, um, and then, uh, you know, our application is really simple. We create a view, um, create a router, and then just uh, start, up, start up the view. And actually the router code itself would actually start the history. So, but now, now our code uh, in main um, is a little more interesting. We're pulling in all of the components that we're, we're interested in to get the application started, requiring them here rather than all over the, the code. We're bringing them into one one location, and we're creating some interesting things um, here as well. Um, one problem with the uh, with the original source code was that some of the modules defined instances and some of them defined classes. And I switched it over to, to, to all defined classes. Um, so, so that now to-do list actually defines a to-do list instead of a to-dos. And we create the to-dos here and then inject it into our application view um, as an option. Similar with the filter, the filter um, is you know we require it in our our main and then inject it in the places that it was needed. So what have we done here? We've moved all those dependencies that were in each of those files into one central location, and where the central location now is in charge of creating all of these modules that we're using and making sure each one gets a reference to the dependencies it needs. So, so why? why does that, what does that do for us? And, and the answer is not a lot whole so far. Uh, the, first, the first thing that it does is to eliminate some of these dependencies so now I don't have to mock them at the require level, at the environment level. And instead, I can just inject something, and and that thing I inject, you know, obviously is going to be a mocker stub. So, like I said, this is just this is just the halfway point. It doesn't feel compelling to me. It, it, this all that dependency injection was, you know, I would be like, okay, but don't worry, this is the halfway point. Um, you know, you'll get all the way through, and you won't have cows laughing at you. So. So, so there's a problem here, though, and that, that is, you know, that main module went from a couple lines of code to all this, and that, that you know, that, that feels kind of big. So, but what can we do about that? So, let's, let's, let's break it up a little bit. 
rather than have one big, you know, you can imagine in a larger application, this doesn't make any sense. You're going to be instantiating, uh, you're requiring all these modules all over the place. You have this huge long list and then try to figure out how to push everything in the right place. So what we're going to do is we're, I'm going to introduce a concept called uh, Composition Plan. And to do that, I'm going to switch over to the DIT branch. Okay, and let's see what's different now. This does look a little bit smaller, um, at least in terms of requires here. But something changed down here. Let's take a quick look to see what happened. I am going to make this font. This is font just right, or can I make this smaller? And is it, is it going to work? All right. Well. Okay, so before we had all everything in the entire app coming in, and now we've got a much now we've got a much smaller subset, and down here we've got a whole bunch of extra stuff going on, um, and I'll, I'll explain that in a second. Actually, I'll explain explain it right now. Globals are bad. Um, <coughs> In the DOM world, an ID is basically the same thing as a global, right? And it's also a resource. It's a dependency. We have a dependency on something. It doesn't have to be JavaScript code. It can be a text template. It can be a CSS file. It can be a DOM node. So in this case, I've gone the extra step. And not only am I removing the dependencies from within the view of knowing exactly how to select things out of the DOM, I've moved that out into the, the um, moved that out into this this main um, already and and this main um, application, you know, has is is what is going to turn into my composition plan. So the other thing I did here is to create another main inside the to-dos folder itself. So this main is itself also a module that has this little bit of of uh, you know composition plan and and composition plans. are basically more modules that describe how to put modules together. Uh, it's more than that. You describe the entire life cycle of these modules. So you, it describes how to create them, how to initialize them, how to connect them, and ultimately how to destroy them. And if we create them right, if we have some structure about how we can create them, we can actually make them so they're composable. And so that's what that's what, um, that's what I did here. So here's here's a composition plan for the to-dos section of the application. And you can see that here's the create part of the life cycle, and we actually have a destroy part of the life cycle as well. And the main module pulls that to-dos composition plan in and actually uses it as part of this composition plan to compose the, the entire application. So you can visualize um, as you're breaking your application up into these, um, these feature areas, these components, um, as, as multiple people have shown on, on, on the screens, they like to take the, the parts of the application that you see on the screen and break them up into, into you know, various uh, components on the screen, each one with its own view, its own model, and its uh, it's an uh, own controller um, in a pure MVC. Um, but each one also has its own HTML and potentially its own CSS as well. And, and if I broke up the CSS uh, in this app, it, that's exactly where it would go. It would go along right, that, right alongside this HTML. So one of the other things that I was able to do was to remove the router.js altogether. Um, realistically, in an, in an, in an app, uh, you know, the router would be more involved. But this router got so, so simple that I removed it as a module and brought it right into the composition plan. So, 
So now, so now this is starting to feel like, okay, we've got these things here, these, these composition plans. They're kind of like their own component that's in charge of you know, um, creating and destroying and initializing and bringing together other components. Okay, so, so this is starting to feel like some sort of pattern, some sort of strategy. Um, and the end result is that the components in here have less dependencies and therefore are a little bit easier to test. And the fact that I have removed the, the hard dependencies on, on DOM nodes that are, you know, exist in the DOM, then um, these could also be shimmed. We could load a, a slightly different environment in the test for our test harness uh, than in production so that we could inject these nodes and then no longer, we no longer have to set up an exact copy so we can, we can, we can test in whatever environment. Um, we see fit, including um, being able to do something in PhantomJS or, or uh, a you know, server-side DOM engine. Okay, so, so I, again, you know, this pattern, you know, it's still feeling like, uh, am I really getting the benefit I want out of this? You know, what, what is the, what is, when is this going to feel like the right tool? And what's the what's the problem the problem here? There's still there's still some big problems in this code, in my opinion. And one of them is is that we're abusing the model to send events. So um, one of the things that a user can do in the app is to use this filter down here to decide which of these which of these um, to do items are visible and which ones aren't. The way the current app does that is by iterating through all of the models and sending an event on them whether or not it should be visible or not and then doing some calculations by comparing to, to you know its state versus this list of hard-coded states to decide when it should be visible and when it shouldn't. So it's iterating through this entire list. Every time you hit one of these, it iterates through all these lists and decides to render or, or not render that particular item. So that's, that's, that's a lot of code to, to do that. So, and, and why are we using data events for doing view type things? Because this really is a view thing. Um, the data itself, has to do with to-do tasks. It doesn't have anything to do with, with what you're filtering on the screen. So what can we do about that? One way to solve this problem is through AOP. Now, now if you're familiar with AOP, um, you already know that it's a way to, to provide additional, beha additional behavior to a component. Uh, so and it's done through, um, through um, decorating the methods on that component. So you've got a, a component A and you want to add additional behavior, you can decorate its methods to give it the additional behavior. What's nice about that is that it's not invasive. You don't actually change the code of this thing at runtime or at compile time. You actually add the, add the additional behavior so that the code stays the same, the code stays, um, you don't have to do any additional tests, you <coughs> actually only have to test the uh, additional behavior independently from the component that you're, that, that's being um, decorated. And what we, we call um, these things that, uh, this behavior that's added aspects, and aspects are, are, um, are basically uh, two things. One is the behavior itself, which we call advice, and then how that's applied. And in the simplest case, that advice can be applied either before or after the function runs. And so if we want to decorate this object here, but before this method runs here, we want some other thing to happen. We would give before advice to this method. If we want something to happen after this method runs, we give this method after advice. And, and what's really, really nice about this is that 
the, the decoration itself is not embedded in the code somewhere. It's on the surface area of this object. And because it's on the surface area, number one, this object doesn't need to change directly. The code stays the same. The second thing is, is that it's easy to see that because of the way it needs to be applied. It's easy to see. Um, it's easy to see the dependency, or actually, I'll show you there's actually no dependency, but it's easy to see that something's been added instead of you know, having to read every single line of source code. And of course, this helps you follow the single responsibility rule of a module. Modules should have one responsibility, and if this behavior is wildly different, some sort of side effect, then, then you know, you're not breaking that rule, uh, that solid rule of single responsibility. So I'm going to show this now. Switch over to P branch. Okay. So let's see what changed here. So a number of things changed here. First thing that changed is we got rid of this um, event on the model that we were using. This is a, you know, we're using this data level um, event to describe a, what really is a view level event. And then get rid of all this code in here that, that dealt with toggling of visible. Actually, we just changed it. So I'll get rid of it, I promise. So we changed that around a bit so that uh, we made it a little easier for us to refactor and call it. I'll show you that in a second. Okay. And the main. Okay. So in the main here, I added this library called meld, meld.js, uh, as part of the Kujo library. And it's, it is an uh, AOP tool. It lets us add this advice to before and after. This other advice is around after returning, after <coughs> throwing. If you only want to have this behavior happen when something throws or after it doesn't throw, it's got all these, um, these um, built in. And I also created this mediator. And this mediator is going to embody this additional behavior. So I'm going to take the behavior that was inside that view and I'm going to pull it out to this mediator. And then we'll apply it. And I'll show you how that works. So here's the mediator. Okay. Okay. So I added another part of the life cycle of this, um, this, this composition plan here. And during the initialization phase of this composition plan, I'm going to be connecting things together. So I'm going to take uh, the application, the main view, and um, when the filter all method is called on, and filter all is, is the, the method that gets invoked when you click those Click these guys at the bottom here, these links down here. When that gets called, it's going to call mediator's set filter method before that gets called. And after it gets called, it's going to call the mediator, mediator's refresh views. So before filter all, I'll just show you real quick. Used to listen for you know uh, these change events. Let's see what the important part is down here. When you clicked on that, like I said, filter all used to run. Used to loop through the to dos, and for each one, it used to call the filter one and and trigger this visible event, which of course went back to the to do view and performed this calculation to see if it should be visible or not, and then. Hit or show it in the render, you know, in, in, in the render method. So, so we're doing we're doing all this stuff, and, and now 
all that is pretty much gone. All we're doing now is setting a filter, calling the render method, which is actually just redrawing, redrawing these guys at the bottom here to keep those up to date. And that's it. That's that's all that filter all does now is just save a value so that the render method can use that. To, to, to decide which of these should be showing. Now, mm, mm, I love that. I'm going to get rid of that too, I promise. Okay, so. All right, so this behavior is now in this um, mediator. Let me show you a little bit more of main. Okay. And then. We added some more after advice to connect up more things in the mediator. And so when um, the application creates a new to-do item, we're going to save that to-do item because, because remember now that um, in the view before, we used to have to loop through all these um, to-do items and decide which ones were hidden and which ones are shown. And I moved all this over to the mediator. So now when we create a new to-do to -do item, we need to keep track of that, and when we destroy one, we need to keep track of that, um, and et cetera. And so this create to do view, we've, I've added three new behaviors to it. And after it executes, we save the to do view, we advise the to do view, and I'll show you what, what that means. And then we run this toggle hidden, hidden because the, the initialization um, of this to do item, we need to decide whether or not that's that's hidden when it's first created. So let's take a look at the mediator. What that looks like. So, um, so save to do item. We're just going to keep track of this to do these to do views in a in a hash. We can. There's all sorts of ways to save this. Advise the to do view. Once we've gotten a new to do view, we're gonna also add some behavior to that. And I could take this and put it into a different mediator, but I just put it here just to keep it all together. So every time one of those little to-do views renders, um, we also toggle it to see if it's hidden or not. So we do it right during the, the, the render there. So each to-do view is in charge of toggling itself. And then when that to-do view is removed, we just remove it from our global list. So we're ensured that this, this hash is always up to date. So all of that specific logic that was embedded in the view about deciding when to hide or show is, is now in our mediator here. So this mediator, its sole purpose is to hold on to these little views and decide whether or not they're going to hide or show. So we took that out of the, the, the view whose, whose job was to manage the overall view and we took it and we moved it over here. What's nice about this is this is extremely easy to test. I mean, this, this, these, um, these functions are seriously easy, easy to test. And now because we took all that behavior out of our view, that view is also now even easier to test. Okay. So, so but there's still a major problem here, and, and that is that is why are we looping through all these things to do something that seems like it should be really simple? Well, you know, all this DOM manipulation since since the beginning has been bugging me. So um, I'd like to get rid of that because DOM manipulation code is code you've got to test, and 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 DOM oriented code just by its very nature, at least to me, is, is a lot harder to test than just pure JavaScript. So I really really want to get rid of that. <laughs> So, so one way to get rid of it is with OOCSS states. And so um, if you're familiar with OOCSS or other structured ways to write CSS, um, you know, the, the main principles are to separate um, the, the presentation from the structure, you know, the, the, the theme from the way it's laid out on the page, or as, as, um, as uh, Stubbernella Nicole likes to say, you know, separate the structure from the skin. Um, and OS, OOCSS states adds third dimension to that, and that is you can actually describe and control application state in terms of the DOM using CSS. And so we'll take a look at that. Right. So let's 
see what changed here. There's a new file here <coughs> called states.css. Made some minor changes in these files here. Okay, there's a new option. I'm going to be injecting something called filter classes here. And as I promised, I'm going to be destroying this ugly mess over here um, and replacing it with something a little bit nicer. <coughs> And there's a new method called set state classes, which is um, a way that we're gonna, you'll see that we're gonna translate from what the designer, because we're pushing some of this job onto the designer, what the designer is defining for classes versus what the engineer is defining for classes. Okay. And we're getting rid of that mediator, because I really didn't like that mediator. I mean, it was it was a great concept, but as soon as I wrote it, I was I was like, this needs to go away because this the, all this DOM manipulation code, and that's all that Mediator did was DOM manipulation code. So we got rid of it in the in the view. The view now does purely what the view is supposed to do, um, and then we're going to get rid of it in the Mediator here and move it all over to CSS. So let's take a look at this CSS really quick. So just a couple of rules here that define whether or not something displays or not. So we've got basically some display nonce and display blocks um, and also some other things here that we're going to change the font weight on some things. And so if, 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 if you use your mind a little bit, you can figure out that these are the filters down at the bottom that we're going to change. And then here we're going to change some to-do list items. So we've, what we've done here is we've defined some CSS classes that define the visual state of, of the things on a screen are, are basically our views or pieces within the views. So, so these guys here are to-do items and these filters down here, we're going to define those, the states of them, whether they're hidden or shown or selected or not selected by these CSS rules. And when you use these, we're going to apply these instead of all of our DOM manipulation code in order to change the state of the app and 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 um, the huge benefit there is is well basically moving all this JavaScript who you know over to CSS and CSS is really I mean that's what this job is for is to to um, to manipulate the DOM or, or not manipulate the DOM but change the state of the DOM so let's take a look at that real quick um, okay. It told me I had 35 minutes left, and I was suspecting that that was not correct. So I guess I have two minutes left. So let's do this real quick. There was a pop-up on the screen, and I didn't bother to do some test it. So, so. OK. Uh, yes, let's take a look at this. OK, so let's just verify that this still works. Let me reload this. OK, and let's, let's take a peek here. This might work. Okay, so here's the to-do list itself, and here's the to-do app. Okay, so here's the to-do app, and you can see it has a class called all on it. And so basically, I'm going to set these states on the top level of this view. So right now it says all, and if we, yeah, let me do something interesting here. I'm going to click on active. That one goes away. And we can see up here now the class is active. Can you guys see that? Now let me just make it bigger. So now the class was set to active. Let me go back just in case you missed it. So all active completed. And so what's happening here is these CSS rules are now being applied. And all that we needed to do was to change, we didn't do really any DOM mani manipulation except to change an attribute on the top node of our view. So all that, the looping code that we had in there to loop through all these guys or keep track of them or, or, or do whatever, it's all gone. All we do now is, 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 um, is change one attribute. And then these styles kick in and let me just show you one real quick. No, I. It 
here it is right here. Here's the, the, the class that we had defined in our CSS file. That's making it display none because now these conditions are satisfied. So basically what I've done is, is, is that completed class right there describes an application state. And So if the state of the app is completed and the state of this particular to-do item is completed, then you can see that display is blocked. But by the way we set up these, these classes, if the application state is completed but the list item itself, the to-do item is not completed, then display none. And so, so bang. So we got rid of all that code, and so I love that. That made me happy when I did that. So. Okay, so time warp. Just in time, because I'm out of time. Um, you can imagine that you know eventually we were going to refactor more and more pieces and more and more pieces, and um, um, that we only really get about halfway into the inversion of control principle here, and then I threw in the OOCSS just to help get rid of some code. Um, but what I want to show you next is a little bit about data binding. I'm going to do this really quick. Um, and uh, uh, I know data binding um, is one of those ferocious topics, and everybody, either you love it or you hate it. Um, again, I think it's just one of those tools that you should use um, when, when, if you want to, rendering is great and data binding works as well. So I'm just going to show that really quick. And, and one of the reasons I love data binding <coughs> is that um, we all worry about instantiating and, and, and destroying our JavaScript objects, but the DOM itself is a way bigger um, hog of RAM than our JavaScript objects in many cases. Uh, so it's not, that's not universally true. But, um, and and uh, just in this to-do MVC app itself, Every time you added a new to-do item, the main view was re-rendered five times. And so basically, it was re-rendered and let go five times in a row. And, and garbage collection in the browser is not very good because the browser will basically not do it as much as it can and just keep grabbing more, more RAM off the operating system as much as it can until the operating system pushes back. And that's why you have to restart Chrome or, or Safari or whatever every, every couple of days because it ate everything up. So we're going to... Uh, we're gonna we're gonna look at this a little bit anyway. So so anyways, I do think that you know there are there are solutions that you can can do with um, with your your rendered views to try and bring them as small as possible. But data binding solves a lot of the same things. So and I'm actually going to show you a version of data binding that has clean templates, and there's a nice uh, benefit to that. And that that benefit is is because you. You've got these clean templates that are pure HTML and pure CSS. You can actually get really good separation, and that allows parallel iterative development between the design team and engineering team. Let me show you just that really, really quick. Okay. 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 So. I am going to totally cheat, and rather than totally keep refactoring and factoring, we started with a pure Cujo app. Uh, this is the Cujo reference app and to do MVC, and we went back and we we put in um, we put in uh, Backbone. So let's see what is interesting to look at here. Um, here are the different areas of the app. We broke up the control section, which is where the filters are. Uh, the create section, which is the part of the to-do. And we see up here, this is the create section up here to create a new to-do. We have the footer section, which is the part down here at the bottom. And we have a list section, which is this entire part in the middle. So we broke this up into to tiny components. Each one has its own uh, set of JavaScript files, its own CSS, its own um, uh, HTML template. Um, and and then we've got some top-level application things here. So 
let's look at this uh, controls really quick. Here is the HTML template itself. One thing you might notice that's missing um, is um, the, you know the the familiar um, you know if statements and other things that that you you you, you would find in um, you know mustache or or templates, um, backbone templates. And instead, this is really um, pure HTML and you know, with these other kinds of tags in here. And, and actually, I'd love to show you one that this tag is missing um, because you can actually build this without any tags at all in here. So, but what's nice about this, this is real HTML here. This will actually run in a browser. So um, what that will allow us to do is to actually create a uh, a design harness, and so I did that. I created this design harness called Controls. And what Controls does is loads just that piece of the app and put it up on the screen. And I'll show you. So this is just the Controls section, and I can play with how it's supposed to behave uh, in the real app. real app, if there are none of these left, uh, this is supposed to go away. This is not going away. There it goes. Okay, so it goes away. So I want to just test that behavior here. Me, the designer, want to make sure it works correctly. I can test to see if there are zero or many to-do items, and I can test to see if other things happen as expected. So for instance, if there's only one item left, I want this to read item left down here. If there are many items left, I can test this. And so I'm testing this component in isolation. And what's really, really nice about this is I don't even need any kind of back-end system to do this because, because these are a standalone unit. All these guys here. They don't rely on any kind of backend system. All they need is some way to load them. And so if we look at this, this controls harness here, all it consists of is you know, the CSS that we need, a couple of buttons that we saw at the top to let us play around. And this is DOM zero type stuff, on click event handlers. Any designer can, can deal with this stuff. And then there's boilerplate script that the designer just needs to, um, sorry, this one down here make sure the designer cut, cuts and pastes that in there and then this is this is this is pretty much done so so anyways I hope that gives you a couple ideas um, about you know some alternative uh, designs design patterns and um, if you want to find out more about some of the tools we didn't get to look at many of them today but we've got a lot of tools in the Kujo toolkit now and um, you can go do that, and here's some resources. We've got some great tutorials out there. Um, uh, I really encourage everybody who thinks they want to learn a little bit more about some of the things we have in our toolkit to go and take a look at them. And if you're interested in a more thorough investigation of IOC, uh, this is one of the best uh, articles on the web right now. So. All right, thank you very much.